on a very beautiful Monday morning or afternoon to wherever you may be. It's the Teddy Bear and welcome to Night Tracks Radio. I know a lot of you are saying we haven't had a cup of coffee yet, but it's okay. The Teddy Bear has the perfect caffeine for you to get you up and going with legendary artists, platinum recording artists. Mr. Gino Vanelli is joining the show and thank you, sir, for honoring us and blessing us with your presence. Well, I'm just glad to be here. I got to ask you, first thing, first thing I want to do is, number one, I really want to commend you on your songwriting. Your songwriting has gotten even better over time. I don't know if it's just life experience <laughs> over the years that is, has been able to just catapult you to a different level. But I wanted to ask you, how have you feel your how do you feel as far as your personal life experience has enabled you to become a better songwriter that's a, that's a really good question teddy uh i always was an advocate of um, great songwriters and the great musicians ever since i was a kid you know i was in a relief band at a place called castle Roma in montreal when I was 10 years old i played the drums and i got to see some great artists like buddy rich uh, Gene Krupa and Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald uh, play at this place and um, that was my high watermark so I, I, I knew it would be a long haul to really get to where I wanted to get to as an artist and as, as a songwriter and so uh, with, with the years what I'm trying to say is that the first thing is the impetus to want to master is the craft and um, you can write a good song when you're 25 but it, a good song when you're 50 or 60 or 70 is not the same kind of song. There is that lived in experience. The question is, do you still have the inspiration, the energy, and, and the pure sheer joy of, of, of doing it? And I find that I do. And that's why it, it, um, it keeps on coming to me and I keep putting it out. I'm just about finished a brand new record. Right now, we're gonna release something this summer before our, our tour and um, I don't know, it just it doesn't stop. Another reason I, I think, too, is that um, to be influenced by such and to see such great artists that have, uh, you know, that I stand on the shoulders of, uh, whether they be great poets or great musicians, great singers, uh, there's so much to do and there's so much to be inspired by. You know, one of the things that I've always found so fascinating about you is that in your live stage performances especially going back to the 70s we're both 21 so i'm i'm all right with that and <laughs> you exuded so much energy i mean a lot of energy but then when you're off the stage you are one of the most reserved one of the most humblest gentlemen that i've ever met before and i wanted to ask you what is it like to actually go back and look at some of your live performances to see the amount of energy that you create drawing so many people with you on this ride? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it was always a question of knowing how to channel that energy and how to direct it in a way that, you know, wasn't buck shooting to the universe. And, uh, <laughs> So I, I've learned how to do that better with, with time. Um, and, and really, it really is all about, you know, streamlining and being very focused and laser-like as to where you want to put that energy. Um, and, and a lot of artists are born with that energy and it, it can dissipate very, very quickly if you keep giving it, kind of spilling it everywhere every night for 300 nights a year. So I knew that it, it, it's, it comes at a premium or it's, it's, a, it's a really a, a, it's a jewel to have that kind of energy. Uh, so I was very careful with it. And that's why after shows, I, I was always very reserved and trying to restore my energy. And then I, I made a decision at a certain time in my late 20s that I would uh, tour, um, but not excessively. Because I saw what happens to a lot of singers that, that play 200 nights a year. They, by the time they're 40 or 50, they don't have a voice left. Uh, it's kind of like a runner that runs too much. You know, your knees are going to go no matter what. And so uh, I, I, I would, I, I do maybe uh, before COVID hit. You know, I was, I would do about 30 dates a year, and that's that's plenty. 
you know, one of the things I want to touch upon is an interview that you did some years ago, and it really stuck with me. You said one of the most challenging things to do is that when you're a person that has an overabundance of energy is to try to harness that energy and really being smart in the things that you do, especially taking care of your voice because your voice is what you have and you have managed to navigate those pitfalls <laughs> and take care of yourself. And you also touched upon that a lot of other artists that came up during that time when you came up in musically, as far as in the seventies, they weren't so fortunate because the excessives that you well know, as far as what the music business has to offer when people in here are telling you how great you are and they're not really being truthful to who you are. And I wanted to ask you, and I know a lot of the listeners would like to know, how did you manage to kind of manage to kind of circumvent that and not get caught up in a whole lot of nonsense? Well, I, life is a bunch of cautionary tales, you know. Uh, I, I, I was a man of faith, but maybe not mainstream faith. Uh, I was born and raised a Catholic, and I, I kind of I wouldn't say turned my back on, on the church when I was 10 or 12, but a lot of things just didn't make sense to me. But I got the gist of what the whole thing was about and the bridge that it was trying to build. And, uh, you know, from here to the unknown, from here to eternity. And so I, I, I made it a, a lifetime journey to try to understand uh, where we come from and where we go and at least understand what other people have said and other people seem to know and then to experiment and to uh, know for myself. Um, and by, by virtue of attempting those things, you you find that you're not going to get into the proclivity that most other people would fall into very easily. But you know that's a wrong path. For instance, if you study the life of Gautama, you know, the Buddha, say, and, and even if you're not a Buddhist, it's a very interesting story, how he comes to, how he comes to understand the things he understands, which is actually almost like the father of psychology, when you think about it. But he was really adamant about walking the straight and narrow path, about not doing this, not doing that, right thinking, right action, all that. And so I said, wow, 2,500 years ago, guys were, were thinking those things. And he was a prince. I mean, he had all the money in the world, and he could have had anything he wanted. And he disciplined himself, saying, no, I'm just I'm walking this path. So I kind of understood at, at a young age to to really do the thing you want to do with this life, to take this life, because it's really here for just a short time, that that if you fall for, uh, you could call them temptations or forbidden fruit, whatever, but if you really do certain things that could harm either your health, your voice, your mind, um, your relationships, your marriage, your, your family, your friends, your sons, your daughters, your pets, um, you're not doing yourself a service. You're just alienating yourself. Without question, I had the pleasure of uh, conversing with um, so many great artists like yourself, and they've always, they really just, it touched me in an aspect where they would always talk about really being mindful to, as far as cautionary tales, being in this business and understanding this is a business first before before music it is a business first and a lot of these young artists they get caught up in the glitz and the glamour and they don't understand the business aspect and i wanted you to speak upon that and i take it a step further at one time you were signed to uh to nanium records herb albert what is it? What is the difference now being with them in Austin now, where you're in it, where you're an independent artist, and you have complete complete creative control of what you want to do with your music, and how you want to go about promoting it? Well, you know, if a man's walking alone down the street, you can attribute you know two things to him: either he's alone and lonely, or he's free. Right. His state of mind. So, if you're a very dependent kind of person. You know, you want to be signed uh, to, to a record company. You almost want to be told what to do. And if you and if you could complain about it, but knowing very well that that you're you're going to be you know governed uh, while you're complaining about it, uh, or you could be an independent-minded person and ready to suffer what independence has to bring. 
and independence can bring loneliness, can bring solitude, can bring uh, kind of a, a certain kind of dimness or darkness that you have to go through in order to get to your next destination. So for me, I, you know, I always was more or less independent. I wanted to make the kind of record, do the kind of music I wanted to do. I was fortunate enough that I sold enough records that the record companies would let me do the music that I wanted to do. And so the minute I, I would have a failure, uh, I mean, I was out, you know, like I was no longer a fair-headed child. Uh, <laughs> but with a and I mean, I always sold hundreds of thousands of records. So like, I was making money for them and I wasn't making very much money for myself. I was spending more money than making it, being on the road all the time, paying for musicians and lights and whatever. Um, but uh, as time went on and the business changed as it is now, uh, I, I don't mind the independence at all. I don't mind the change. I don't mind not being ruled um, by, by, let's say, the mainstream. I, I kind of like the splintering of everything because uh in the old days right. it was one guy control like you know 200 stations and if you didn't this guy didn't like your right, right. You just didn't like it. so i'd rather roll the dice with um with people who are you know are splintered and and people have their own taste and have their own vision and 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 your audience will gravitate to your own vision whatever limited audience that is it doesn't have to be 80 million people but it could be people that are adherents to how you think. And that to me is, is powerful. You know, the first album that I bought was a 1975 album, Black Cars. That album was incredible. It was raw. It wasn't glossed over. It was just raw, pure 100% unadulterated Gino Vanelli. Do we have an opportunity? <laughs> 84, I think it was. 80 was 80. I thought it was 75. No, no, 75 was, uh, I think, the second or third album. Third album for no, no, okay, the third. Okay, I'm getting really good with it, but I know that was the first album that I bought. And I wanted to ask you when you kind of go back and look back at that particular album, and it was so critically acclaimed, if you had an opportunity to go back and redo some of the tracks, would you? Or do you think that's the best that you could do on that particular album, on that particular project? No, there are, I mean, I, I would, uh, it was, the album was designed for, for radio. Um, at that moment in time, I had a terrible contract dispute with, with Arista Records, and they sort of got me blacklisted in, uh, in, in the business. No one would touch me and all that kind of stuff. And it was really, hard painful especially after coming uh, off of the two hit albums like brother brother and uh night uh so i had to find a way to get back in the business so i, I recorded black cards mainly for uh, a world audience a worldwide audience uh, especially european audience so that's why it went kind of the way that it went uh, i never recorded another album like it but it served its purpose there are some good tunes on that record, Black Cars. I've done it with big band style. I've done it with symphony orchestras. I've done it with a trio. I've done it many, many, many arrangements of Black Cars itself. And there are a few other tunes too, like Hers to Be in Love, I've done with an orchestra, the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, and the Metropolitan Orchestra in Holland. How long did it take you to kind of evolve with the music industry? Because as you just stated, it has changed dramatically <laughs> there's no more record there's no more record stores anymore yeah, yeah. Think streaming during the time of your recording a lot of stuff was being recorded new as far as analog everything is digital now you had to physically get up and go to an actual recording studio and now you have a recording studio in your home where you're left to your own devices so how have you been able to kind of just change and as you say, you got to move, Lord have mercy, to move with the times. Well, uh, it, you know, a lot of people think that things like the Bible or a lot of sacred books, the Constitution of the United States, um, a lot of the things that, that seem to be have a lot of dust on them uh, that were written a long time ago. A, a lot of people don't understand that we build upon we don't want to erase it. We, we, we correct it. We better it. We better ourselves. 
So for me, the digital world doesn't mean anything to me. Right. It, to me, it's it's all the natural world first and how we deliver it. Now, the digital world is just another means of delivery. Right. But it's really based upon the natural world of waveforms. As I'm speaking to you, there are waveforms, right? So we, we've copied waveforms with, with ones and zeros, and we know how to get it across to each other. So for me, it, it, I never stopped being an analog artist, thinking of how I'm going to rehearse with a band, with a drummer, with a bass player, so on and so forth. So even when I'm recording a record alone, I know how to play all the rhythm section instruments. When, I, when I'm recording a record and I'm playing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm hearkening back to all the years that I was with some of the best musicians and what I would have them play or ask their advice on or something like that. So it really comes, what I'm saying to you is that it, the center is the same. It's just the way we speak is a little bit different. Right. You know, for instance, you know, you could always be hipper than hip and get into all the, you know, the quantum mechanics and the, the quantum fields of, of the entanglement and all the Einsteinian things and all that. But no matter what, even Albert Einstein knew this, is that there's something called morality, kindness, love, justice, mercy. Those are staples. Without it, we have nothing. We can talk about all, you know, the doodads and high tech stuff we can talk about. But if I can't trust you and you can't trust me, um, and if, if we're, we're secretly trying to annihilate each other, it doesn't matter what technology we have. It won't last. Life will be terrible. Without question. I've had this conversation numerous times. I said one of the things that really truly bothers me, it seems as though we've lost we've lost the ability to have empathy for one another. And it really comes across in today's music. Again, one of the things that I've always respected about you is that all of your music has been very transparent, but it also comes across as being organic. And I wanted to ask you, in the beginning of starting the writing process, what comes first? Does the melody come, does the melody comes first or does it the, the writing aspect first? Which one goes like, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, so to speak? Well, be, before anything else, the desire to say something. I'll, I'll um, maybe jot down either on my phone or, or on a piece of paper, napkin, whatever. If an idea comes to me just because it's, it's a concept, you know, for instance, a song I wrote called Yet Something Beautiful on the last of the Wilderness Road record. I went into a coffee shop and I saw a, a man in a wheelchair. And he had, um, I, I think, something like Parkinson or a terrible stroke. And his, the woman he was with was taking care of him. And she treated him exactly as if she, she, he was the man she always knew, with extreme dignity. And while everybody was remarking on his grimaces and his loud noises and his you know, his sudden behavior, uh, I, I looked at her and said, day in, day out, she's with this man. And she, she has the patience of gold, and she's an unsung hero. And so I said, I must write about, you know, this, this incident. And so I just wrote a, a title that came to me. It's tough, it's tough, it's cruel, and yet something beautiful. I said, That's, there's the title. So for me, it's the intent and, and the, the will to want to say something, uh, something that strikes you that's worth saying. And then it could be, for me, it could be a poem that, that, that and if I know I want to make a song out of it, I'm careful with, uh, with rhyming scheme and meter, um, or write it in free verse and, and wor worry about rhyme and scheme and, and, and meter later. Sometimes it's, it's a melody, I'll just sit down on the piano, and, and I'll say, oh, I like this melody. And then I'll search through my poetry and say, I think this would fit. Um, in the past, I have written the kind of songs where I'd have a title and a couple of lyrics and then start to put in those, those, those words and those blanks. And that's a very, that's more or less a Cole Porter, you know, Lennon McCartney kind of way of, of writing. And it, it's difficult because you're trying to many times put a square peg in a circle. Right. <laughs> uh, and so it's a real talent in itself. And then the other the other way of writing is more like the Bernie Taupe, Elton, Elton, Bernie Taupe and Elton John style, where he'd write a lyric 
and he tried to put a melody to, to the lyric and probably edit the lyric as he's going on. So like, for instance, the, the, the Good Thing record, uh, there's nine or 10 cuts. I think eight of them were just poets, were poems before they were songs. And um, this, the, the, the poetry and the words spoke to me so deeply that I felt motivated to, to write melodies to them. So the long answer is that it comes in all ways. <laughs> Absolutely. For those who are tuning in late, shame on you. For the teddy bear, we just forgive you. We've been joined, of course, by the legendary Mr. Gino Vanelli. And I got to ask you something. You have equally two talented, super talented brothers and Ross and Joe. And I wanted to ask you, what has it been like for you, three of you collectively, to work together? Because it seems as though that you guys have these kindred spirits that you just have this wonderful working relationship where you know what each other is thinking before you start, before you start the process. <laughs> It's true. Uh, well, because we, we grew up, you know, in the same household and my father was a singer and a musician and uh, we got turned on to the best records, you know, of the day. I mean, we were listening to Sarah Vaughn and Ella Fitzgerald and, and uh, Miles and Coltrane, all those guys uh, when I was eight, nine, ten, and they were blasting at the house day in, day out. It wasn't just like, oh, this is interesting. That was the staple music. And then by the time I was 12 and the British invasion came around, you know, we sort of liked the Stones and some of the Beatles stuff and the Zombies and some other groups, you know, that came from England. Uh, but for us, it was always the jazz aspect, a little bit the classical. Uh, when I uh, was, I think, in fifth or sixth grade, we got taken to see the Montreal Symphony rehearse. And they, I think they played Daphne and Chloe by uh, Ravel. And uh, I fell in love with that music. I, I, I thought that was music really that was divine. It was sublime and heaven sent. And so I've been a real fan of the Impressionists, uh, the late 19th century, early 20th century uh, writers from, from uh, France, Paris, especially. And um, so all, all my brothers, you know, and I, we, we all listened to the same music. So we all had the same kind of religion prescribed to. <laughs> you know what I find interesting is that and I don't like I've never liked this term fans because it comes across as being so generic so I'll say family members supporters what has it been like for you from a personal aspect to know that you have been so loved and so revered all this time they're still with you when you go out to your concerts and you perform the venues are sold out what does that mean to you does it ever get old or just one of those in the moment type of things it's like wow you know what they still they still dig me they still vibing with me they still love the music that i'm putting out you know i don't feel that way i i feel like i'm constantly trying to earn their love and appreciation so uh, I, I never felt that I had it. I always felt that it's, it could be passing. Maybe I experienced a moment of it. Um, to tell you the truth, these days, you know, uh, a lot has happened you know, in the last three to four years, especially since the pandemic. I lost my mom to the pandemic. Uh, and and it, it was horrid, you know, the way it went. Uh, and we all have our horror stories about it. Right. Um, I just lost one of my favorite, you know, dogs a few months ago. Uh, we were so close. He was my shadow. Things happen, Teddy. You know, uh, Trisha, my wife, has had some real challenges. You know, um, when, when health, bad health strikes, or or some kind of tragedy or misfortune, uh, you either fall or succumb, or you. you you find a way. You find a way to deal with it. But you're, you're just a different person. You know? Right. And then you are when you're 30 or 40. You're just not looking. For it. I make music right now. Um, simple, simple joy and simple love. Of music. We're going to be doing 10 concert city tours. Uh, to 10 cities uh, in this upcoming tour uh, in September and beginning of October. I haven't been on tour for maybe almost four years. I did two dates in in, uh, in Florida uh, in March. 
and it was very eye-opening. You know, I, I, I had such a great time. So we decided to do 10 days this fall. I'm anxious to do it. I want to do it. Um, do myself in shape and all that. <laughs> but right. um, I, I, it, it's just it's just different at, right. at this age. You know, uh, I try to keep it clean and try to... The day that I don't want to, or the day that I, I can't, I can't reach the notes, or I can't sing properly. If my vibrato is not right, or I'm singing out of pitch, or whatever it is, the day that that happens, uh, I'll be the first one to, to bow out. It seems to me I may be wrong. Won't be the first time, and it definitely will not be the last. You've always come across as a person where music has always been very therapeutic to you. Yeah. You, you, you've given so much abundance of love to so many people, but it's eye opening to hear that you give so much, but it's, I want to use the term challenging to receive it or accept that kind of love back. And I know that you're a perfectionist. I've, I've seen many interviews that you've done over the years. You're a perfectionist. You're never satisfied with anything that you do. Is that challenging sometime for you to yeah. even be somewhat receptive to even receiving compliments about your music? Um, I, you know, I, I try not to take them uh, seriously uh, because I would have to take the extreme criticism as seriously, which I don't want to take. <laughs> God, God, God bless the critics. Yeah. yeah. No, it's look, I, I, I I'm, I'm almost finished this new record. The, the new record is called The Life I Got. And it's okay. stories about my life in the last few years. And um, one song is written right after my mom's death and it was so on and so forth. All, all the things that have been happening. And I, 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 I'm, the days are going by very quickly as, as I'm doing. Yeah. I'm enjoying singing. I'm enjoying writing. I'm enjoying doing it. And um, the expectations uh, have, I think, are changed with, with what's going to happen with new works. Right. Uh, it's, a, it's a very strange marketplace out there. We don't know. It's hard to measure success anymore. Yeah. So that you have to measure it, first of all, by how you feel what you want to do with it. And if I could bring a little joy into people's lives, you know, then that's great. And one thing I found out that I did know, it just was thrust upon me recently, is that you have a very large base of people, supporters in Japan. It's incredible. They love your music. Um, I used to, really good friend of mine, Bobby Caldwell, God rest his soul. Yeah. We talk about that all the time. He said, he said, Teddy Bear, every time I go to Japan, they would treat me like royalty. I would be so revered and so respected over there because they still have stores out there where you can buy albums. They have vinyl. And it's a beautiful, it is such a beautiful thing. It was something unique and special. Saving enough, saving up enough money to go to a record store and buy vinyl and see the cover art, the minor oh, notes. I know, it's a beautiful thing. I, it, I, was, <laughs> it, is. it was a beautiful thing. And when they took that away, just something, some part of me, just like, you know, something's not right. Something. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, this thing has, has changed a lot, of, a lot yeah. of life. Because, I mean, when we were kids, it was a moment you you came home with the new Marvin Gaye "What's Going On" record, and you, you sat down, and that's all you did. You just right. listened and you meditated, and you were with Marvin, and you were on the trip. You were taking the journey. Uh, today, I mean, most people just look at their phone. Oh, I think I'll listen to ten seconds of this. Our attention span is, is right. Uh, and I'm not going to criticize it. I'm just going to say that you kind of don't know what you're missing. Right. You know, when when you can get into a piece of music. And it sends you, brings you to another place. It enriches you, and and you you kind of um, get away from the narcissism of navel gazing and looking at your own problems and yourself all day, day in day out. And you can just escape yourself for a second. There's something restorative about it, and uh, we had that as children and uh, yeah. teens. 
and uh, maybe it'll come back in a different way. It, it won't come back the same way, but maybe in a different way. I, I hope so. To me, the loss of innocence has been taken away from us uh, <laughs> tremendously, tremendously. And family, be sure to get all the latest updates. Make sure you stop by Mr. Vanelli's official website. That's genov.com so you can get all the latest updates as far as upcoming tour dates. I got to ask you, when do you think there's a possibility that you'll come to Texas and perform? Um, I think it's going to have to be next year. Um, I, you know, I, I think I'd like to, there's a couple of cities, obviously, that um, we're thinking about San Antonio, we're thinking about Dallas, we're thinking about Houston. Um, it's probably going to be next year because I have some orchestra dates that I have to do in the, in the fall, and there's a, so much preparation. There's a... Um, Longoy Symphony, which is this, I think, the second most popular symphony in Canada. Uh, we're going to be doing a date in Montreal on November 5th uh, with a 60s orchestra. And uh, it's going to be a very unique evening because it's um, it's really all the classical arrangements. It's not like a pop world brought to classical. It's very, very, very um, they're orchestrated arrangements. And it's going to be a night like no other night that I've, I've ever played before. Because no rhythm section, nothing. It's just me, piano player, and the orchestra. Okay. And then, uh, we're going out this fall. We're starting with the LA at the Savant Theater. September 1, and then we're go next day. And I think we're playing Cincinnati, and Louisville, and uh, oh, a bunch of other places. Pittsburgh, uh, Maryland. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, because it's, it's going to be, in some cases, four or five years since I've been there. Yeah, that said, the feedback has been been incredible. They definitely people that have not had an opportunity to see you perform in years. They are salivating for that chance and said, "Well, how do I?" Good band, Teddy. This is uh, uh, <laughs> we've got a brand new piano player, uh, David Goldblatt, and uh, David is an amazing piano player. And uh, the band can be better than ever. We're ready. I mean, to do it. We love doing this material. Something in my heart now. A lot of a lot of artists don't like their older things uh, that they've done. Of course, we treat it a little bit differently, not change it completely, but we add some spice to it, the horn section. Uh, I love singing those songs. It, 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 I get a buzz out of singing Nightwalker and you name it. You know, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's fun because hell, I mean, God, I mean, writing those songs, the the, the, the intervals singing some of the notes are so challenging uh, that you gotta i gotta really practice and you know vocalize every day to keep keep up you know with what i wrote many years ago do you think the lack of musicianship in today's industry is hurt the overall quality of music of course there, but it, it goes deeper than that. I mean, if, if uh, it, or actually more shallow than that in a sense. If you have, uh, sometimes I see some royalty checks from say Spotify or whatever, uh, and, and they're, they're, they're paltry sums. Uh, I'm not complaining. All I'm saying is that if you're a new writer and you want to become a really great songwriter, when we were young and up and coming, if you wrote a hit song with top 10 and billboard, you stood a chance to make a few hundred thousand dollars at least in the beginning. Right. And maybe if it was a big, big hit that would remain, you could make a million dollars off that one song. So not that everybody achieved that, but the promise of it was kind of like a lottery. So it made better writers out of a lot of would-be musicians or would-be writers. And today, knowing that there really isn't that pot of gold, a lot of people figured, why should I bother to become a writer? Right it takes really a lot of years to become a good writer. There's a lot of studying to do with how to mesh those lyrics and with the melody and what constitutes something original. And you'd have to go back and study your musicology and get back to Irving Berlin and Cole Porter and, you know, Ira Gershwin and George Gershwin and then Lennon McCartney and then Jimmy Webb and Burt Bacharach and so on and so forth. You study these guys who were the proficient writers of their time. And, and what makes a great song and before you could en even emulate it it may take years and then once you've emulated now 
take take the training wheels off and do it yourself. Right. And and uh, if we don't have that pot of gold, a lot of people would rather buy an instrument that has a button that says, uh, you know, R&B groove, uh, right. this groove, <laughs> that groove. You know, right. um, I, re- I I I there's no fun in recording that way. You know, right. Very, I, I mean, I like to really get into it. It, it is is very is very frustrating because, as you said, you know, during the '60s and especially the '70s, it was a time of the singer songwriter. Oh yeah, a lot of good. Ones. I mean, I didn't know how I was going to compete with them. I mean, if you once you heard uh, Stevie and Marvin Gaye and Curtis Mayfield and some of those and uh, some of the uh, the Temptation songs, you know, all confusion, so on, and Rolling Stone. And, once you heard all those records, it was and those great songs, Find the Family Stone, and then and then even the the, the more balladeer David Gates and Fred and uh, Cat Stevens and Elton John and James Taylor, these were all really great songwriter singers. And they were so good at it that when I was 17, 18 and coming up, I said, Wow, how am I ever gonna write a great song like Fire and Rain or Tea for the Tillerman? Right. Or, uh, but they were great teachers because there was a lot of great material out there. And the only way was to keep playing it, keep playing it, get in your head, pl- play with it, study the chords. Oh, this is how it goes. And then once, like I said, once the training wheels comes off, you kind of venture out on your own. And then, you know, I took a lot of uh, piano lessons, uh, music lessons, vocal lessons. That always helps too. I would I would suggest that to the new upcoming musicians. There are some good vocal teachers out there. Get to understand what the voice box is and how to treat it, practice and strengthen it. It's a muscle. Yeah. And then you know, if you're a musician, you'll be a better writer. Without question. I, I mean, I've seen it firsthand. I want to go back to. Another great duo. I mean, they can't stand each other, but they're great songwriters. That's Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah. Exceptional songwriters. Yeah. Exceptional songwriters. Yeah. I know. But they just they can't stand one another. I just, you know, we, I, 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 <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know it was that it was that violent between them. Yeah, they just not good. It's it's not good at all. That's not good at all. Yeah. But, you have managed to take care of your voice. Your voice still sounds as smooth as a baby's touch. You're still looking phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, you're still looking phenomenal. And I, again, I just want to thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule and joining us. And also another compliment that I have to lay on you. My goodness, the river must flow. You redid that and you just, and I'm going to tell you something. I, I'll admit this. I was bothered, but I said, wait a minute, how are you going to improve on perfection? Because the original version, it was raw. It was really yeah. raw. And you came back with this just lush, polished, and kudos to Brian McKnight, too. The whole it was wonderful. How do you feel you did on the reissuing? You no, know, I got to tell you, I like the record myself. Yeah. <laughs> I, do, I do. I like the job my brother did on the video. Uh, I think Brian was just so kind. And, you know, I did a great job on those back vocals. I mean, he's just smoother than whatever. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's like paint on a wall. You know, just right. lush, you know. Uh, and and uh, I just had to feature him, you know, because he was... It, brought the record to a higher level and uh, I had to change lyrics on it because because of the kind of uh, vibe we did with the new river must flow that raw feeling wasn't there it was a little bit more of this a little bit of um I don't know a uh, reggae groove a little bit in in there and, and a little jazzified a little yes, more, <laughs> yes. Little Wurlitzer, you know and uh, and so uh, some of the lyrics didn't didn't really work, so I, I, I reworked a couple of lines of the choruses, and um, that was difficult. That was difficult because when you have the original uh, in, in your head and you know it's not quite right for the version you want to do, what to change it to, right. and how far to go. But uh, it, it turned out very, very nicely. And, um, 
it was great. And again, I I was like, wait a minute, you know, it's like, how dare he <laughs> try to do it? I'm like, come on now. But you did a wonderful job. And last, one last question before I let you go. Yeah. Have you ever been approached to doing music scores for any movies? Because that seems to me that would be right up your alley. Well, I learned very quickly uh, that that is a click unto itself. And to break into that click, you, know, you just have to uh, keep nagging and keep nagging and being there and being there and being there. What about me? What about me? And I just didn't want to do that. You know, I had other things that I wanted to do. And the, the couple of times that I was asked to get into that world, okay. that world is like, you will do as we say. This is mm -hmm. how we want it to be. And this is the lyric you will sing. And this is the, they are, I mean, the directors of the movies and all that, they have, they are the producers. I'm really used to producing myself. Right. So unless someone wants to take my song outright just because it fits the music, and I would be gladly, you know, gladly do a performance again, it's, it's, it's very difficult for me because uh, I, I, the song I was given for a major, major movie a few years ago, that was, I'm not gonna say which one, I was given a song to sing and maybe tweak some of the lyrics and all that. Uh, and so I had some ideas of how I wanted to change it and nobody wanted to change it. And I thought wow. that the lyrics were just too dumb for me to sing. So that's <laughs> as simple as that, you know? And uh, because I don't know, how many times have you heard a theme song to a movie, a singer sing a song to a movie, and it used to, that's a killer song. Right. And just a beautiful lyric, beautiful performance. That's really rare. That's it like is. one in ten thousand. All the all the theme songs I hear from movies, uh, they all feel like well, they're trying to fit a square peg in a circle or something right. like that. It just doesn't really work. It comes across as being very contrived. It is. Yeah. <laughs> it, comes, it comes across as being totally contrived. I know, I know in the past that you've always spoke very glowingly about Prince and his musicianship. Yeah. And I wish you two had an opportunity to work together. I, really, <laughs> I think that would have been something very, very special. Very special. Uh, look, I, I feel really bad, you know, with what happened to him. He got stuck in a vortex, you know. It's, it's partially what the business does to you. Yeah. That if you become that famous, you start believing all that stuff. Yeah. It's so much, and you can't, you can't be a normal, down-to-earth person. And then you try pushing yourself, pushing yourself, and then you have to take the drug to make yourself feel good to... So that right. your hip could work and you can get on stage and next thing you know you're stuck yeah in this spiral and um that's what happened to him. yeah i want to i want to thank you for saying that because see most people don't understand that when you give so much of yourself especially as you stated earlier doing the constant touring giving yeah. all of yourself not just playing but performance wise it takes a toll, not only on your vocal prowess, but it takes a toll on your body. And oh, especially in Prince's case, I mean, yeah. he did these high jumps and all that. And yeah. again, you know, he was a perfectionist in his way, and he wanted to be absolutely devastating every night. Yeah. So uh, the problem is you start thinking, well, whatever it takes, if this little pill can make me my hip feel better and I can do the thing that I want to do, well, it does work for a little while. Yeah. Then the damage is deeper. And deeper. Yeah. And that's uh, then what ends up happening is that it damages your your spirit. Yeah. And that's that's the real problem. So um, that's why, Daddy, I this life is is whether you're a musician or whether you're a plumber, uh, it's a spiritual life because of a lot of thought, a lot of feeling. You have to take stock many times when bad things happen to all of us and you have to look into yourself saying how do i deal with this how do i be this person that i need to be either for that person or this person your wife your lover your your son your daughter whoever it may be your mother and father when you to rise to the occasion of being the kind of person you can be 
it's it is a spiritual experience and what i mean by spiritual is that which is not known that you have to reach for and and uh we're talking about these artists they're faced with that and that's yeah. spiritual, spiritual uh, experience of, can i let this go and can i say this is enough i don't need to do this is my life worth worth that or not right. and uh, those lines get really blurred for a lot of artists especially when you get to your majesty princess right. because all all the data tells you that you are this god yeah <laughs> and, and you're, <laughs> your head and your perception of well we are all truly blessed number one that you're still here that you're still making great music. Um, can't wait for the new album to come out. Everybody's waiting for that. <laughs> but while you're waiting, family, be sure to get the latest album. Of course, we know what that is. The latest album, more of a good thing is available. You can actually go to Mr. Vanelli's official website. You can actually purchase it there. And also, again, be sure to check his website out. You can also get up the upcoming tour dates. Be sure that you get there. I don't care if you have to get there by train, plane, automobile, even a camel. Make sure you go see this very talented gentleman <laughs> before I'm live. This is your home away from home. Whatever you need, Mr. Vanelli, please do not hesitate to let us know. We love you. And more importantly, we respect you for being true to who you are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Teddy. You take care. Same here. The legendary Bye -bye. Mr. G Gino Vanelli joining us here on Night Tracks. Remember, family, get the latest album, more of a good thing. The entire album is incredible. He reissued The River Must Flow featuring Brian McKnight. It was a man, he did a wonderful job on that entire album. And make sure you go see Mr. Vanelli perform live. If you haven't yet seen, you are in for his tree. <laughs> you are in for a tree. This is part of my bucket belt because I've been following this very talented gentleman for years. I love his music. I love his transparency. I love his passion and it truly shines through. And he has managed to remain humble for all these years. And I want to thank everyone for tuning in and allowing the teddy bear to help you tune out all the negativity. Thank you so much. And watch the interview in its entirety. Be sure to go by our official YouTube channel. That's at Night Tracks with two X's. That's Night Tracks Radio Podcast. That's on YouTube. And be sure to follow us and subscribe to our Facebook page. We're here to bring you the type of artists that you love and respect. We want our music shaken but never stirred. Lord have mercy. That's at Facebook dot com forward slash lotl radio the zone also on tiktok i know modern day <laughs> we're on tiktok that's at tiktok at night tracks radio and also on instagram that's at instagram.com forward slash lotl the comfort zone radio i want to thank everyone terry lynch donna mary francisca gail mary lou wendy thank you so much without you there's no me i remain humble to all of you god bless and as in always keep it so full here on nitrex radio lord and mercy